moving right along, uh, policy updates. Um, yes, um, so earlier this year, we have uh, two work groups that are currently working, and so we wanted to bring the board uh, some updates and then ask for the purpose of work sessions is to have the board have an opportunity to have a dialogue, ask questions, ask questions of those who are doing some of the work, give us some feedback to, for continued work. And so by no means is today a culmination of anything, but rather just the next step in getting your feedback as engaged partners in the work. So um, we had one uh, policy uh, request that has been moving forward, and, ha and we just wanted to give an update on the, um, I guess what we're calling the nepotism policy. It may turn into a protocol, it may turn into, um, it may turn into a policy. Um, and so at the beginning of the year, we sent uh, an email to all of our employees, uh, just giving them an update or the rationale and the why on uh, why we might be considering a nepotism policy. And so since then, uh, in October, the administration shared that plan with uh, the policy committee and staff. Um, in November and December, we conducted a survey using Thought Exchange. And so in your packet, uh, and I will make it uh, public as well after we have our policy committee meeting uh, next week, uh, is a link to the thought exchange. So you can see more than 1,000 participants participated, more than 300 thoughts were generated, and then nearly 13,000 ratings, meaning that they were reading each other's uh, thoughts and then giving it a one to five star rating. One star meaning they do not agree, five stars meaning that they, um, they agree wholeheartedly. Um, then we'll also be able to look at themes to see where uh, most of the organization is thinking. Um, and so what I did at the back of your packet is just to share with you some of the thoughts that came out of the thought exchange. Uh, number one, saying that a spouse should not be on the hiring committee of another spouse. Um, or that board members who are related to employees should abstain from decisions related to that employee's position. That's already uh, board policy and state law. But it is good to get the feedback from our, our employees to know what's on their minds uh, and where we agree and where we don't agree. What's really nice about thought exchange is you can see where a whole group of individuals who mostly agreed about something and a whole group of individuals who mostly agreed about something but different from each other to see where their differences were but also where they had common ground. So um, we'll be mining that with our policy committee uh, next week. And then we, uh, um, uh, Ms. Smith is going to be bringing at the January uh, policy committee meeting um, executives from HR company, uh, HR executives from Columbia companies uh, to do a panel and to just give us some insights about what their rules are in their businesses um, and, and to help inform where we might go next. Um, so I think, Mrs. Blackburn, did I miss anything there? Uh, no, thank you for your, all of your, of your work on this. I'd especially like to thank you for surveying our teachers. It generates great ideas for us to consider as we move forward. So the thought exchange, I think, works really well that way. Um, and also thank you to Nikki Smith for her work to pull together a panel of um, community leaders that can help us start the process of carefully thinking through where we might go with this. Perfect, thank you. And I guess I would add, it wasn't just to teachers, where we said to all employees, so I'm sorry I misspoke, to all of our employees, because it, this, is, this is an organizational question. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I think we're making good progress, and um, in February or March, we may then take the work from the panel and from the policy committee and from the thought exchange and then work on a work group that would then craft what our policy or protocol through HR might look like. That's and pretty pretty clear here with what what the thoughts were it's like three main pretty yeah the themes are not they're not hard to no. uh, to discover yeah yep so that's nepotism is there any other questions or or anything that you would like us to be considering or a possible question for the panel <coughs> um, oh, oh. You got first. um one, I, I like the way it's organized, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have a, you know, a timeline of your expectations, which I think is really good. Um, and it's also helpful to see that there's, um, it looks like fairly strong support of moving forward on something like this. As always, the devil's in the details and then implementing it. Will you have a kind of an internal task force then to implement as right. well. So that would, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Well, um, I'm, 
a lot of it might uh, fall to uh, Ms. Smith as you were, as you, because of her role, but um, as far as identifying and then uh, those that do need to be grandfathered or something oh, like exactly. that. Oh, exactly, yes. Kind of yes. the technical part of we'll it. We'll have to figure that out, okay. right. Particularly if, um, I, I would imagine, as you, as you saw in our letter to our, um, our employees, that uh, the policy committee um, and from board members I've talked to that there is, there is a, um, there's support for a grandfathering clause, not to move everybody around, uh, but this is about moving forward with, with a set of rules. So we'd need to establish who, they, who that is. Right, right? and um, how, to, how it be clear to everybody, I think, because you know, it, we talk a lot about how we want to attract and retain the best educators and employees, and so we're not trying to disrupt that, but then come up with a plan on how we transition through the you know next couple of years or so. I'm what I'm what sort of examples would you be talking about for grandfathering? Uh, so uh, I would say, ba well, would you like to? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, so based on what the work group comes up with, for example, uh, two employees who are married and work at the same school, um, if they're not supervising each other, that may be sufficient, right? If you have, uh, that may be okay. If you have two individuals uh, at the same school and one is in a role that could be considered supervisory, a grandfathering rule would need to be established for us to understand what does the grandfather rule say. And then if it says, moving forward, there can, you can't have uh, a, a, an individual who's in a position that could possibly be supervising uh, their spouse uh, or partner um, then um, are we going to move that person or are we saying moving forward we're not going to allow that to happen and then how to uh, <coughs> maybe address promotions or something like that where somebody goes from a non-supervisory role to another good role point yeah. right how so you have two employees who are married they or in a committed relationship and they work at the same building and one now gets promoted to a role that could be considered a supervisor what is the trigger, what is the rule for that, so that it is um, applied e equally um, and consistently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, my biggest question on that, because that's the one thing in here when looking at it I am apprehensive on, is in the same way of if we, it's not gonna happen all the time, but if we have spouses that are specialists in similar areas and we're gonna say, well, we're not gonna hire you at the same location, we might be losing people that are good in, in future respects. So I guess the thing that I would, just asking for a policy to look at is like. That's, that's arguably the reason why this policy was eliminated a long time ago. Okay, is just like, it, is there a way in the system that we could still have people get promotions, become in supervisory roles, and someone above them is really the one who's evaluating their spouse or their family member? I mean, I think about the fact that as a instructor, I've taught people who I've personally known or are very close family friends of mine, or like just, I say family, but not blood family, but family there. And I would just ask my supervisor, I said, when it comes to the grading, will you just supervise that grading of that one student? And so I guess that's where I'm wondering of, when, as you guys are talking to industry and other representatives, do they have examples of that or do they feel that that's just too complicated? I think that's a great point to bring up. Mm. and. Um, I think when the committee takes that up and we can hear from those community members who've been invited to speak, I think that's an excellent um, question that we can ask them because that obviously isn't unique to it, the educational system or, or our public schools. I think that, you know, in, whenever we, you have a policy or a procedure or something like this that, that we adopt, I think anytime we start looking at well, but, mm -hmm. and that sort of um, less than a really uniform application. It's not always good to do things in a uniform way. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think we need to be really, really mindful of ensuring that we're doing it if we are going to provide for exceptions or deviations from an adopted procedure or policy that we make sure we're doing it even-handedly and from equitably across the board. It just worries me just a little bit. I agree. If you're going to have a policy in place, then it needs to be I mean, otherwise, some people are going to feel slighted. They very well might. Yes. Well, and I also just think about the equitable side of it on the economic side of our employees. Of if 
a family only owns one vehicle and they work at the same school and then if someone goes into a supervisory role and we're saying well one of you has to move now to a different school I, I, I'm, these are hypotheticals I understand that I'm, I'm just thinking about that would be part of the decision to take the job I think I mean that would be they'd have to work through that personally so we'll work on um, protocols that consider evaluations right and we'll make sure that one of the next steps we ask is uh, to ask that panel so what do you do about uh, evaluation you know, what do you, what do you, about performance evaluation, those types of things, uh, or if they're uh, not just evaluation, let's say a, a grievance or some type, you know, what happens when those things happen in your business? So we'll, we'll make sure we ask that question. I really appreciate it. You bet. Yeah. And I would just say it's um, important to recognize that it's probably harder when you're transitioning from one policy <coughs> to a policy like this. And I would guess many of the leaders that you talk to, they are already there and they've hired people in with certain expectations. So um, don't get discouraged, I guess. But that's where it gets into the details, I think. Perfect. Well, we'll keep you updated. We thought this was the appropriate time mid-year to sort of make sure that we were engaging you and, and, and asking you for your thoughts. So um, under uh, Mrs. Blackburn's leadership, we'll, we'll keep marching forward. Uh, and then the second piece we wanted to um, bring forward, we know there have been lots of questions and um, there's been a couple of meetings so far. <coughs> there's been a work group that was formed to consider uh, the recordings of IEPs and 504 meetings. Um, and um, there have been two meetings to date, one in November, one in, in January. Um, in your packet, you have the list of, of people who have participated in those meetings. Um, also in your packet, there's a, an independent um, concern from uh, our parent in the group about um, recording uh, storage. And so I imagine that you have lots of questions for our, uh, the leader of, of, of this work, of this work group, as well as we've asked our IT team to be here to okay. maybe answer questions from their perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I asked them was, could you be present on Thursday to talk about the benefits and, and drawbacks of, of a third party storage, uh, meaning like in the cloud? Um, that was a question that um, Cushing had asked me to ask them. Can so. we walk through what a possible process might be from an IT standpoint and what equipment would be necessary to, to affect that? Would that be acceptable? I mean, I think that that's part of the deal is I don't know how it's gonna work. And so if we're talking numbers, I wanna know that it's sure. gonna cost this much and this is, has to be done, and we're, you know, there's labor costs, and obviously, you know, so besides the record. If it, would, if it would be okay, Please. maybe I could ask Elise to come, maybe just to talk, give a little overview summary of the work and the, the document, and then, um, and then we can quickly move into storage as that question, but maybe just in terms of uh, looking at um, what the process looks like now might be a good way to start, just what does the process currently uh, look like? Um, and then for us, and I think, did you bring documentation about uh, the letter, the yeah. process? Okay, that'd be great for the board to have. So I we'll talk about process, and then in terms of recording, what, what we're currently doing, right? Because if a parent asks to record because of um, their own ADA needs, um, how we're handling that right now, where we're storing it now, and then what it would look like uh, if we were to adopt a policy or if the law were to change what that would what that would require us to to do on a larger scale okay does that sound okay yeah, yeah sounds good it's a good start how's that good i just want to also thank putting on this on the agenda um this morning so that you know we can all learn about it because like you said it is a topic that there's questions on so Elise and Leanna thank you very much for getting up right well, I know you're up right and early every morning but uh, coming here to spend time with us thank you and one of the reasons why we asked to sit at the table instead of at the uh -huh. at the work session table as we typically do is because we're recording this so that anyone could see it if they're not able to be up at this hour <laughs> that's a great idea <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. so um, so um, at least, would you mind just talking through the current process uh, that we use when a mm -hmm. parent requests yeah. uh, for a recording? And then um, then we can maybe get into the question that Mr. Cushing has, if that's all right, about 
Okay, so what happens if we take this to a larger scale and have to think about recordings? And that's when we'll tag Arla and ask her to, to, to share. So I think it's important to point out that, that there are two, um, the documents that I just, are the, the processes and the letters that I just gave you are things that we're using now because there is a board policy that states that IEPs and Section 504 meetings cannot be uh, recorded. So therefore, we had to have a process for if a parent needed accommodate or a parent or guardian needed accommodations. So if the policy were to change, then these pieces of information would not be necessary <coughs> because the policy would change and, and IEP and 504s could be recorded. So therefore, we wouldn't need these, the, the letters would not be required. The process of, of asking for, of, of submitting the letter and me giving the um, okay to do it or not would not be necessary. So I, I want to make sure that those two pieces are separated and so all of that information would go away if the policy were changed or if the state um, made changes to the law. In that case, would we record every meeting then from here, from there? Um, I, I don't know that I can, I, that my thought would be that it would be a parent request. Okay. Um, I, I don't think as a district that we want to record every meeting, but I, I, I don't, that's not, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you my opinion. Gotcha, no, that's, that's <laughs> all I want. Um, I mean, we don't see it as a need that we okay. would have to record every meeting. Okay. Um, so currently, the process is, uh, our, our request is that the parent would contact the case manager at the school, a parent or guardian, and then they would get the letter to request that. So you have, you have two letters in that packet. One of them is one that we are currently using, and it is the first one that you see. So you first have the, proce the, the process for the case manager, then the next one is the letter that we are currently using, and the next one is a letter that was drafted by our attorney because there was questioning about us asking for the individual's um, disability, the reason they needed to have the accommodation. So we asked our attorney to draft a letter. We are not currently using that second letter. We are using the first one. Um, we wanted some input from her because it gives additional explanation as to why we are asking for the person to identify their disability. It goes into additional explanation because we are asking, because that person is asking to do something that our board policy says that we don't allow. So that, there's, a, there's additional explanation in that second letter. Is there a, a plan to convert to this new letter? I, I would like to, <laughs> okay. uh, but my concern also is I want to be sure that we're on solid ground before we, um, because I don't want it to appear that we've started with a pro with, with, with something and then now we're switching to something different, now we're going to switch to something different. I know that's very frustrating to parents in the community, you know, when things like that happen. So I want to make sure that that is, that we are solidly um, behind that before I would distribute that out. So, so yes, I, I, my, my expectation would be that we would do that. Okay. Um, so the, the expectation would be that the parent would contact the case manager because we want that information to go through the case manager. Then the case manager would request that um, either get the letter from me or if um, uh, we don't really have it on a place where they can just go to, so I would send it to them. The parent would then submit it and um, really it says, uh, I know on the process it says that I think it would be um, replied upon in, uh, I think it's three days, and, and typically I've been getting them, and it's within um, less than 24 hours if a parent is requesting to, um, to record. At this point, we've not had anybody that is asked to record that we've said that they cannot. Um, we've not denied anyone of that. Pro of that. Uh, we have had situations where we have arrived at a meeting, and the parent has asked to record they're at the meeting, and so we have not proceeded, well, excuse me, we have not allowed the parent to record because we don't have the means to do that. We don't have we, we don't have a digital recorder there. Um, we're not going to ask a, a, a um, staff member or a teacher to record on their own device. So we have offered that if they would like to have it recorded, we can certainly um, end the meeting and then we can re reconvene at a time that we can go ahead and get. Um, the digital recorder there for us to be able to record it as well. So what's the importance of having the digital recorder rather than letting the, 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 um, the um, organizer of the meeting record it? I, I'm going to, I would defer to IT about the reason for that, but I, I would not 
I would think there would be, or just personally, if I'm listening to that correctly, I would feel concern about the confidentiality if it's on somebody else's device. I don't yeah. feel I kind of just wanted to ask the question because yeah. uh, Again, of the, the audience and because it's important that we sure. all establish. Yeah. In the same way, like my IT staff, I provide them with technology. I don't expect them to show up and use their own personal computers to provide support. And I agree with that 100%. Yeah. yeah. And it, go ahead. Yes, I, uh, I have a <coughs> follow-up, and that is uh, when the parents request to record and you say we cannot, and if a parent says, well, I can do it, you know, I can do it on my phone or I brought the necessary equipment, what is your re response to that? The response would be that we as the district would need to have a copy of it as well, and so then we offer again to end the meeting and we will reconvene at their convenience. Okay, but you will not let them do it at that particular time, even if they say, I have everything here, I can give you the information. Would you change their meeting time then, or would you would proceed on to at on that day, at that hour? If I would I would stand I, I would state that board policy is that the, at this time we cannot record IEP or, or five oh four meetings. Okay. Um, if the parent were to choose to record it without me knowing it, then or, or the staff member knowing it, then there's not really anything we can do. But we would not, um, we would state that that is against board policy, <laughs> and, and we would we would stop the meeting so that we could have it if we knew it was actively happening. Okay, a follow up, please. Yeah. The follow up is that <clears throat> if they are using their own device, they have told you up front that they will be accountable for what they record. It is just for their records because they need to understand it better. Do we have the policy in place that we're saying, no, I understand that we are not going to record it. I understand that we're saying that we will give another date. But if the parents say, I just want to put it on my iPhone so that I can understand A, B, and C, can I do that now? So regardless of the reason, would you cancel that meeting and make them come back at another time because they have been honest enough, and I know that this is an issue, they, it, they've been honest enough to tell you that they want to record, and because of their honesty and integrity, then we say no. That's right, we'd have to say no. Because Understand. we don't, only because we don't have a choice about which policies we follow and don't follow. Okay, so, so our board policy prohibits the recording, which then compels the school to follow the policy. And I wanted to reiterate that because that is absolutely the fact that we are compelled to under the policy. So therefore, parents are saying, well, now you are forcing me to do some things I don't want to do, and they're coming in and recording in their purse, or, or the man in their jacket, whatever it is. And so that is just something that I know it's policy, I know where we stand on it, but parents are saying, you guys are making us have bad behavior because we only just trying to do what's right. And I just wanted to bring that up and out because that is an issue for parents of trying to do the right thing. And then we are, by policy, slapping their hands and saying, by policy. So I understand why we're going forward on this, but I do understand that People are saying, but you're not talking about that. You're not saying that we are asking permission. And I wanted just to lay that out, and I understand why that permission cannot be granted. Right, Thank and you. that's why it's up to the board on policy. Of course. And your team is executing on what policy we've had in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I understand. But it was still a hidden agenda, if you will, that I felt that needed to be addressed for my sake as well as others. Thank you. Okay. I'm a little confused. Um, did we not approve the policy change on KK? Is yeah, we did not. No. So with, for no. ADA? No. It's, it's still it's yes. always been there. It's it always there been there. Okay. We wanted to clarify the language uh, so that it wouldn't it wouldn't be confusing to anyone because it just says applicable laws, and we were at one point trying to move forward by eliminating the language uh, regarding 
the superintendent and secret recordings, right? Yeah. Because I don't secretly record anything, and nor would I think that it's imp that that's appropriate language in a policy. Um, and secondly, to clarify and make it clearer what applicable laws means. Uh, we didn't get there because uh, the board did not approve the policy as it was being presented. So <clears throat> I just want to follow up a little bit with what Della said because so a parent, the first time they ever, the first time ever they have an IEP or 504 meeting, are they kind of told that they can't record, I guess? So the, after the first time, obviously, they know that they have to get permission or their permission's in their packet or something, right? It, it is not something right now that we would that we state that, that like this is a menu of accommodations. We we don't have that. Like we don't have a list of you could potentially have it in Braille or enlarged or an interpreter or um, we we do rely on the, on the parent for that. At this point, they probably would not know that um, recording you know would be something that they could do. The I think that the piece of that that's really important, and and I understand that a parent wanting to record and be able then to take that home and reiterate it, but at that first meeting. The, the fact is, is that it is our job as the district to make sure that that parent understands while they're sitting there. Okay. Um, it is our job, whether it takes us, you know, to, to repeat that several times or to um, give ad additional examples, is that the recording and, and a parent being able to take that home and then, you know, like, oh, I'm going to Google that and look up. That, that's not, that, that is not the expectation. The expectation is that on us as a district to make sure that that parent understands what, what, what those services are, what is least restrictive environment. It is, it is a new process and we, we completely understand that. So it is up to us to make sure that that parent understands. And, and I, I, I truly understand there probably will be some parents you know, that, that, may, that may say they understand that, that they don't. But we need to have done our due diligence to make sure that we have explained it um, and that that parent is able to meaning, meaningfully participate and also understand when they are there at the meeting with us face to face. Okay. So, so I think that's an important piece. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be thoughtful. We have uh, allotted 25 more minutes, and I know that the storage question is an important one. Okay. So um, I have one yeah. question that kind of bridges this gap. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, I item number two. Right, on the list that we got and mm -hmm. stuff here for all of us. If you didn't see it, it's in your inbox and in the doc as well. Um, how many days notice? Uh, and and I, I believe this is just kind of a working document here. One just thought I had um, as reading this, and I'm sure I'll have more as I continue to read this, but I've only had you know, once over. Um, and, and it's something from a, a past meeting where um, often or suggested that meetings can sometimes be scheduled rather quickly. Um, and I think there was one example of like the day before. And so when I see that there was like, you know, they should notify a parent or a case manager within five days of school, I was wondering if there could just be language of, or at time of the scheduling of the IEP or 504 meeting. And I think that clarifies that up and g gets everybody on the same page and wouldn't by just casually scheduling an appointment create a create a conflict there but yeah I think I think that's completely appropriate because yeah. you're, you're exactly right there's times that the parent will waive the 10-day notice and be willing to come in the next day um, absolutely yeah. um, you know we would we would accommodate a parent if, if a parent wanted to um, uh, record in that situation we would do that yeah and so I, I, that's important and we'll I'll make sure that that gets added yeah. would it be fair to say we're gonna make every effort to do that because there have been occasions where a request has come in the night before. We've tried to make every accommodation to, to make it work. Um, technology services is closed at that time. We want to be able to, you know, we uh, have and to that was at the same time. Just at the time trying to find a scheduling. scribe that was yeah. unavailable. So there are times where we make every effort mm -hmm. and we, we might not be able to do it. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah. but that's fair. So I'm, can you just tell me exactly what I, the topic was what happens when a meeting is scheduled at the last minute or something like that? Like within that five days, and a parent oh. waives the 10 day um, notification. 10 day notification. Yeah. If a parent's waiving that 10 day notification and it's within four days of a meeting, what's the resolution there? If everybody's on the same page, can we find an accommodation? Yeah. There? And maybe it, it's intentional, but the letter that you shared says seven days. And, and again, that is, yeah, that is a draft. Okay. Um, that was um, with our attorney, and, and yeah, so we can absolutely change those. And, and again, we've typically we've gotten it, and, and I, we turn it around very quickly. Hmm. Um, the um, so I think that absolutely, I think that's something that we could we we would make every accommodation to do that. And I think that if 
um, one of the other pieces that we're dealing with right now is that we don't have a digital recorder in all of our buildings right now. So we are having a little bit of a management issue in that, for example, if it is requested the night before, then if that building doesn't have a digital recorder available, then we need to figure out how to get it there. And so if we had them in all buildings, if we move forward, then that would be less of an issue as well. Related to the digital recording in today's environment then, so once you have recorded the meeting and you have the recording, it becomes part of the student's, I'm going to call it a permanent record, but or the record. How do you um, do that today and how is it indexed back to the student and then... Uh, Would that be an okay transition to technology services? Would okay. that be okay? We'll bring them up. Sure, too. and then kind mm -hmm. of related to that, it might be a technology question then. Um, do you image in today's environment all of the IEP documents and are they indexed to that student then? Within our system, within our IEP system, SpedTrack is what we use, they are that is where we keep all of our records for all of our students. And anything okay. pr from a previous um, IEP system that we used is in Content 360. So, so they're housed so that we can keep them because we've switched over to a different um, okay. IEP platform, but we still have access to all of the records previously for that student. Okay. So, so from the time we started using our new system, they okay. are all, um, all of the records for the student are within that system. So sped track. Um, and then you said, this is to help me later when I'm learning about this, sure. and then 360 is the old system? That is, um, I'm, I'm going to, it probably would be best if um, Aaron or okay. Arla answer that, okay. because what I understand is that okay. that's where our records from our previous um, are kept, and so, okay. um, yeah. Previous system. Uh -huh. And then, also curious, if you have a student that moves to Columbia, so they've been in another school district and they bring copies of their old IEPs. Do we image those and associate them back with the student? We do. Okay. Yes. Just curious. Gotcha. Yeah, we would request the um, most recent IEP and the most recent um, evaluation. Okay. So if I may, Dr. Monroe, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. So maybe we could start with that first question uh, that Mrs. Malidi asked about tracking back to a student, like linking, um, uh, and, and maybe, sorry, even one step before that, what are we currently doing when we have recorded? How are we storing that? Then? When we have a current recorded IEP, since our new um, accommodations came out and we started recording, when we have that new recording, after the recording is made, that teacher contacts the technician for that building. They then secure the device bring it over to Aaron, who then puts it up on one of our file servers. One of those file servers then has a link back to, in eSchool, the student's record. There's a place where they can click and retrieve that file. So that's what we're doing with it now. So it's a physical carry from the IEP meeting, again, to keep it secure and confidential. It doesn't stay there, and the teacher has no responsibility. They don't need to do anything with the uploading. We take care of all of that on our end. So it's just stored on one device eventually, or one storage system. There's not a second copy on the device. Correct. The right now, the preliminary role of this on the recording, we only have two recorders right now because we were just doing some basic testings on workflows and, and some trying some different options with us. Uh, we worked with the aid department, uh, Dr. Wilson, on putting something in the permanent record. Everything that we do within the system and we keep within a personal record is stored within Content 360 and in our student information system. So we have to make sure that, that content number one is safe, is secure, and it's backed up. Uh, like I said, you know, everything we do is at an upper level. You know, we can't just throw it in the Google Drive or put why? it on a thumb drive. So why can't we do that? Let's, let's, so, I mean, I know I'm, it's a loaded question, so let's. <laughs> uh, as we see, a lot of the school districts throughout the United States are dealing with a lot of ransomware and a lot of diff threats from outside of the school district themselves. Uh, we have been lucky enough to not have any issues with this because we've taken certain precautions on everything that we do. We look at everything from a threat level of the data that's there. If it was lost, if it was compromised, how would we recover? So the costs associated with this, are that is taken into effect. Uh, the Content 360 server that uh, uh, we talked about earlier is what we store everything. If everything's stored in-house, that's what we currently use and everything. So the 360 isn't going away. It's not like it's a legacy no, system no. that you're migrating from. That's 
permanent. Correct. And then you have sped track that is a separate module that's unique or special to special education. Content 360 houses all of student records. Okay. Not gotcha. necessarily just IEP information. Uh -huh. It will house everything, okay. transcripts, all of that thing. So that's what we store in Content 360, all of our student records, not simply IEPs. The SPED track is a software that SPED uses that they write and evaluate and store their IEPs in. Okay, and then you do you currently transfer those IEPs back to the 360 then, so it becomes part of that? All the old ones, the older IEP software that we had that we uh, did away with, the IEP Plus, we took those records and we moved them to Content 360 so that they're still, whenever I looked up, Jonathan Sessions account as a student number. I can that see would be interesting. Yes. Lots of room. <laughs> yeah. A lot of entries there. Has it been 23 years? Uh, yeah. You can see actually all the information that's there from the old system, uh -huh. and that allows you everything. This would just expand upon that with the recordings. So when we put in that student's number, we would not only see his information on his records, we would also see the recordings, and then they could be retrieved that way. And then also, just uh, I'm sorry, I'm belaboring this, but from the SPED track, if they're uh, drafting and creating this IEP when it is concluded and finished does it migrate over to 360 also and become part of that overall I believe it record? stays in sped track but it's tied to the student number so it is actually pulled up so so the recordings would live in content 360 okay so it would make sense though it seems like uh, for us to index that so that the IEP the written part is then associated with that same recording that would be done in eSchool that that connection is done in eSchool on the student's record so when I go in and I pull up Mr. Sessions just front page record I see that he has an IEP and there's a link there to the recording and it would link back so that would all be done through eSchool instead of sped track because there may be someone needing to access that a teacher that's not a sped teacher might need to see something going on there and not be going back and forth to the IEP is eSchool the same as 360? No. The, they're tied together though, and that's probably the confusion okay. that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like I said, that what we have right now is Content 360. Content 360 is tied into our student information system. So it's one place to go that kind of trickles into other systems. So you can see it all within one front end. That gives our teachers, our special ed people, and everything to go to one place to see all the information instead of going to multiple places to gather information. It's one place, it makes it easier for them to pull that information. Except that they have to go to SpedTrack to get the that it, Correct. And where yeah. is that stored? Uh, SpedTrack is actually a proprietary software that they house themselves. Could you get a little closer to the mic just so they can... Oh. Uh, SpedTrack is a proprietary software that they house on site. So SpedTrack installs, they house it at their location. Okay. They're so a so vendor we use for that. Yes. We do not store SpedTrack on our servers. It's stored on their servers. Okay. So then... Again, with the Google thing, we really didn't get, understand the answer. So why wouldn't we use Google? Integration is one big thing. We have no integration feature right now okay. as far as with that, with the student information system, as far as having one place to go. If you had a teacher or a SPED person have to go to I, I a SPED track, go to student information system, and then go to Google to pull the data, it's a lot of different places to go. It's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. We like to have it in one convenient location for them to be able to have it. Can that be done? Possibly. We were told to put together something that we existingly have. We will be more and more willing to research that and see if that's another availability option. And then the recording itself is actually housed on a permanent basis in eSchool? It would be in Content 360 if we went with the plan that we proposed. Okay. If we would like to look at a cloud solution, that's something we'd have to research. Okay. Well, the, the, the um, last, at our last board meeting, Google was brought up as a solution okay. that was free. So is it free for us? Or fifty dollars, I think it was. Well, I think I think what we have to think about when you think about keeping IEP records for the duration of a child's life until they're twenty-three years old. In twenty years, will Google be here? Will it be free? We have to think along those kinds of lines as well, okay. because we go and store everything up there, and all of a sudden it's not free, and that's been a fear of people for years. When is Google going to stop being free? Then all of a sudden we're held at ransom, if you will, because our data is there. So there's a little bit to be said about housing it yourself, owning it yourself, especially when it comes to student permanent records. Sure. Um, it's not just email so to speak, it's a student permanent record. And I think we need to be very cognizant when we store that in a free solution or even a cloud solution because we are then at their mercy to get our data back. And they can at any time start to 
say it cost you. So that, that would be a fear I would have. Understood. Good answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What what would be the size of one of the files so far that you, or is it ran, or is it different? So there's a lot of variables that fall into play of exactly how an audio file is. We went off the basis of about 700 meg per MP3 for an hour. The average IEP is roughly around four hours, you know. So that gives about a three gig size per meeting. Um, and then we extrapolated that out. We planned for a five to seven year growth cycle. So it was pretty close to a petabyte. So we went ahead and just threw that number out as a petabyte because it was a good round number to have. Uh, we reached out to a, a few vendors, just rough costs. And like we said, we wanted rough costs on this because we have a bid process that we have to go through. Of course, the number could be much lower. Um, that's something that we had. So that's where the number we came up with. And when we were doing our calculations as well, we had to assume every IEP would be recorded because we can't say a certain percentage because we do not know. So when we did our calculations, we had to assume all of them, 504s, because you have to be able to account for that because we wouldn't want to come back and say, well, we've got more than we anticipated. So we, we sized it out for, let's say everyone is recorded. Um, everyone needs it recorded or you all require everyone to be recorded and we had to house that. And is that a one-time cost, the 800000 for the storage on site, or I saw well, something that made it sound like it was an annual. Yeah, no, it's not an annual, but that wasn't just storage, because you're talking about you have to have administration for this, you have to have all the recorders in all the buildings, we have to have people training people, so that was a lot more cost involved in that than just the physical storage of things. Yes, it's a lot of storage um, for us to house, and it wouldn't have to necessarily all be bought at once. We could scale up, but knowing that we would need to scale up. Like we wouldn't just go buy a petabyte. You know, we might buy half a petabyte or a fourth of a petabyte and then scale up as we see the need and see our numbers. And so, then, but we had to bid the whole price as a big thing so you knew that at one point it may balloon to that piece. The, what, we have the Content 360 license currently. This shows um, an additional 20,000. So is that for an additional module to? That, that is correct. Okay. Yes. And then, but today, you can successfully record if somebody requests um, and retain that and associate it back to the student. That is a preliminary thing that we're doing. We haven't enacted that recording into Content 365. It's just stored on a file server that we have currently now. So it's not really tied in the student record yet. We were waiting on what was decided by the board if this was a plan moving forward that we would start enacting some discussions with special education we would have discussions with aid we would make sure that the workflow that we had was something that worked for us you know the worst thing that we want to do is become detectives uh, if an IEP is not recorded and someone doesn't remember and it's been a couple years the last thing we want to do is now well <coughs> did they record this IEP well I don't know and, and so if we have a workflow yeah, that says be. we have a standardization we always have an outcome that's the same we know that we have the data. What is the, re I tried to find this independently and couldn't. What is the retention schedule for under both IDEA and FERPA? It seems like it might be a little bit different for. To, our understanding is that the IEP record has to be kept until the student is 23 years old. So that that is what we calculated that on. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. There, there's, some, there's some additional pieces that I You'll can. have to come up, sorry, just because we're recording. So it is, it is possible that if we, were going to, um, if we were going to destroy records, and we would have to let the parent know. So it, there is the potential that if um, we recorded an IEP for a kindergarten now, a kindergartner now, and that in 10 years, if we were wanting to get rid of those records, we have to notify the parent. But I mean, there is a process to it. It can be done, but we also have to have notification. But, the parent could say no I, I don't you know I don't want to because my child is still in school so there are some pieces that, that can be done but we also th that is contingent upon does the parent you know want us to keep that and we have those rec we have to make sure that we've notified so does that make sense would it be fair to say then absent consent we need to retain the IEP records which would include the recorded meeting until a student is 23 okay yes um, and then when a student transfers from, let's say, district to district, um, I assume that that information that we have compiled with respect to the IEP would also be transferred, right? Are you, are you asking the, the document? The, yes. The, the or file. You, the thing. 
the, well, the what, like whatever's that's a good in question spectrum. To ask how we would transfer the. Well, audio I mean, file. we do it now. I would imagine there these are electronic documents. This is just a different file format, but I would. It, it sounds like from what you said earlier. Typically, if you transfer into a district, the incoming district would request the most recent IEP, and so I don't think that historically they transfer everything. everything. Right. Uh, it's That's not like right. a doctor's well, file. Well, what I was getting at was if we have a student who transfers yeah. out, do we transfer everything and then we're no longer responsible for the maintenance of that file? I don't. And it sounds like that's not the case. No, we hold okay. on for records. So students that are no longer uh, enrolled and attending with us, we still hold their records with the possibility if that school possibly lost them or something like that or the child came back to the district, we would have that information still retained for our records. We have to keep all student records, not just IEPs. All of those have to be kept for a certain retention period, mm -hmm. regardless if the student leaves your district or comes is, in. Is that is that FERPA IDEA or is there some is there a state, state law as well? State, state. Missouri state Secretary of State, state says okay. our reten or sets our retention rates. Okay. But you, that's good to know. You bring up a, a good point, uh, not that this would be the initial focus, but as we um, figure out the nuts and bolts of it, there would be the question, well, what if somebody does transfer out and in addition to the copy of the most recent IEP, they want the last recording? So how could that be accommodated or could it be accommodated and how would you do that? But like I said, I don't think that's the first thing we need to tackle. But. We would have to talk about resources that the other school district possibly had. Um, because they might not even, they might not even have the ability for this. Exactly, so. exactly. Can, we, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Stiefelman, when we um, spoke to the superintendent, uh, superintendents in Tuscaloosa, mm -hmm. um, do, have we talked to them about the mechanics of how they do their recordings? I haven't. No, I can. Uh, uh, we've reached out to special school district in St. Uh -huh. Louis, since okay. that's a Missouri district that uh -huh. um, uh, we've been told uh, allows recordings. So we've asked for their policy, their procedures. Oh, good. That was one of my notes as far as... Yeah, I was, okay. I'm, I was trying to be mindful, and I was thinking we, we may start to transition to next steps for the work groups, questions that you'd yeah. like answered, work that you'd like done so that we can keep the conversation going and the work meaningful. That's what I had written down as far as if we could get examples of policies and also um, pre procedures. I was wondering if um, with our relationship with the 360, um, Content 360, would they have some examples or people they could refer you to that are uh, already recording and storing these? We can ask that question. Okay. Because they might be a great person to talk to. This we asked the question if they had the ability to store those uh, MP3 files and, and tie it to the student record, and they said yes, they did, uh, but they didn't elaborate on if anyone was currently doing that. Okay. Uh, I know that we do store scanned images of different kinds of things, and, and that's what ties us to the student information system. That's why we bought this software, so all the kind of residual paperwork that comes with a student coming into our district. Uh, that ties it directly to one system. So you look at that one student number, like I said, and you get all of that information. And I, and the other thought I had that I wrote down was, um, I appreciated how Ms. Munn says you were talking about uh, training. You know, if we would move forward, how would we do the training for our educators? And I think it would be helpful, similar to what we saw on the um, nepotism policy, Kind of a, a timeline you know if if this would happen because it is a, a board decision or it might be a state law that changes it if we were told tomorrow this is what we need to do what are these steps and timeline but i think it makes a lot of sense to train um, everybody at one time so that you can get similar questions out there and everything like that yeah and i think just i, I would say that um you know in terms of implementing a, a, a plan to accommodate recording for when it's requested for ADA purposes, I think it is pretty, it's a, I think it should be a priority that we make sure that we're getting that in place and that the work group is coming up with that. That's important. I mean, it's- Because that's it's, like a pilot also for this like other the program. Law. Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. Can we talk a little bit more about security? 
So Ms. Bones has kind of deflected that, I think, when we, when I asked specifically about why. I wouldn't say deflect, she just passed it on to those who have. <laughs> yeah. 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 so, thank you for the. Uh, deferred, she deferred. Deferred, deferred. deflect. No, defer, deflect. Yeah. <laughs> Stop running again? I mean, don't worry. <laughs> no, uh, so why, you know, it's complicated because I want to make sure that when we do it, uh, obviously the process and how, how we define that is important, but why can't we just record it on anything and then, you know, oh, so it's a, I really maybe you can elaborate on why you're hand carrying the device back to Well, you got to think that's, that's, a, that's absolutely a HIPAA and a FERPA thought. I mean, you have, and just like IDEA thought. It's IDEA. It's, it's everything that we keep secure and hold sacred on a student record is on that recording. And so you don't want that passing through school mail. You don't want, you know, it laying on a teacher's desk until they, you know, are able to get it uploaded. You have to keep that, you treat that like you would an IEP document. An IEP document that has everything written in it is not something that's just passed around. You know, it's accessed securely through a system. And so we, we need to do the same thing with the recording. And um, even within our system, access to our students' IEP is limited, Restricted. isn't it? So is it Absolutely. limited just to the current classroom teacher? and a certain number of people within that educational group that the child's working with. Yes, yeah. yeah, so, so, so the security for, in the, for the specialist would be able to. It, there's a high yeah. level of confidentiality with all of the documents that we work with. Absolutely. Are you saying that if it were in a Google document, we couldn't assure who has access, or is that, that your question? That would be question? my question. I think okay, that's, that's a question. And I yeah. think Mr. Think, Cushing is asking uh, that same question. Can we ensure security and confidentiality of that document? And if, accessibility. And who has access to it? Uh, we would have to do a little more research on that right now. Currently, Google is a is an open forum. It's built for collaboration. It's built for the sharing of information. Uh, when you try to put constraints on that, because at its core, that's what Google is, is, is the ability to do that. We would have to look at something more like Microsoft Azure, S3, Amazon, stuff like that. But these are all things that we would have to research and want to make sure that we have integration into different systems. You'd have to write code in order to make those work in any Possibly. way, shape, or form. Possible. Mm -hmm. um, okay. okay. Well, I think the bottom line, we're a heavy regulated industry, which one doesn't automatically think of, like banking and insurance being highly regulated, but we are. And you have very specific um, legacy systems that are designed for education. And recording is a new element that needs to be integrated within that. Uh, so we need to think holistically about the solution. Does SpedTrack have a solution to, to record and upload? They do not. Do parents have access to SpedTrack directly? I mean, can they log in? No, they do not. That is strictly for our, our special educators to because that is our platform to um, write the IEP, um, make the changes. That's where, we, that's where we keep all of that information. So that is only accessible to our specialists. The other thing I would suggest as far as, you know, as we're looking at timeline because of the budgeting process is understanding, um, you know, what's a one time, and, and I know it needs to go out to bid, so these are estimates, but um, what would be the one time upfront costs and then what would be maybe your best guess at an ongoing cost, just so we can think about it for the budgeting purposes. Um, and then I just have a, I know that we're short on time on this, but I have some things that I would like to see the work group kind of analyze and look at. So one of the biggest things that Paul brought up is that um, this information is not set up front to our parents to let them know that they have access to this right if they do need ADA accommodations currently. I, I think the work group needs to figure out how that's going to happen in helping train our teachers on letting their parents know that because that's a, I mean, we legally are supposed to be doing that, and so if we're not if we're not making sure that that information is there, I think that's a little problematic on for me in my personal opinion on that. Can, can I say quickly? Yeah. We did with the welcome letter that we had, which is posted um, on our on our website, and we did send out through email to all of the emails that were available to our parents of students with disabilities. It does state in there about accommodations and okay. and stating so it it is. It, I don't know that it specifically said that, but we did state that you know if parents felt that they needed accommodations to please let their case manager know. So um, we did share that to let us know if they needed accommodations. Um, specifically about recording, then no, that's not specifically written is that they can ask that, but 
All right. Um, and then something that I also would like to see um, currently, because I, I asked, I sent you a bunch of PDU and Peter, a bunch of emails, like asking for what all this is procedure wise. Um, I'm glad that we have a procedure for currently that we're working on and like that, that's our draft. And as you guys were talking on the technology side that like this is what we're piloting to see if it works best for us. Um, I think that thinking about what a procedure would look like and you kind of talked about what would go away uh, if uh, us as a board chose to change our policy or if state changed. And so I think ha figuring that work group, figuring out what that procedure would look like for our teachers, what that kind of training, what that session, like what, where, when that would, sorry, when a training would happen for our teachers if this ha got implemented in, uh, by us or by the state and then um, a deadline. Uh, and what I mean by a deadline is just a deadline of when we can see a draft of what that procedure could look like um, uh, if state or us as the Board of Education changed the policy to allow recording of IEPs and 504s for all. Um, another thing that I wanna look at, I, I would ask the work group to look at is an equity issue that I'm uh, potentially seeing. Uh, one of the things that happened here uh, that you're seeing in your notes is uh, it goes, once you have received the email with the audio recording, send the audio recording to the parent guardian. I don't know who wrote in red, but in the red it goes, if the district does decide to send our copy of the recording to the parent, Liana and I do not think it, it so I'm assuming at least, uh, it should be the case manager. We think it should come from our office. However, we don't think it should be sent at all. Um, my question on that is, as we've been talking about recording, we're saying that the parent is making a request and they're coming in with a recorder. Um, I think that's making a socioeconomic, socioeconomic um, assumption that they're gonna have a phone that can do that or they're gonna have a device that's gonna make a quality recording. And I think that we should just make it on our, our end because we know that if a request is happening, we're gonna record no matter what, that we say that this is gonna be accessible to you, whether that is in uh, 360 or however we decide to do it as a secure way, but that it is gonna be accessible to the parents. And potentially build into our budget, uh, I know flash drives are not very expensive, but to say a, a whole store of flash drives that then we could say here here's the recording kind of thing. If that's right, because I don't want to make the assumption that they also have, I, I don't know. It, but somehow we computers want to be able and to stuff. Give yeah, I just think that it's um, it's I, it's just something that popped up, and I'm just really trying to make sure that we are not creating barriers f for our parents when they're wanting sure. this, and especially when going forward, if we say a blanket procedure of anyone can request this, I don't want there to be a barrier because well, we're not going to give you access to our recording as a school district. So I just want to make sure that that's the work group looks at that. Um, paperworks, I, it was brought up uh, that you said that potentially there could be a problem that arises where we don't know if a recording happened, if there's like some lo loss of data or we're not knowing. Something that I thought about as we're just sitting here listening to y'all is potentially beyond just in the audio recording stating as in the procedure that you shared at least with me around like asking, saying the parent, parent, you consist, you consent to this recording and we're gonna have this recording and them saying yes. Also having paperwork that they sign that goes into the file so that we know that this meeting was verbally consented to but also writtenly consented to and therefore we'll know on our end as a school district, we did have a recording or no, you never signed this paperwork to say a recording was gonna happen. So. There, we're, we're not liable to that there was a recording for that meeting. Um, and then also just um, a deadline. I would really like a deadline for when we're gonna see a draft um, of what a procedure could look like. But just reiterating that of um, if, we, if policy changed. Because I think that's really important just for us to know what that is. I understand that it might not be the concrete procedure, but having a draft sooner than later uh, I think would be better. And I understand this is, it takes time, it's a process, but um, it'd be awesome to know what that deadline would look like. May we just I have take a very quick follow up? Okay, and it, then. It's very quick, but. Thank you. But uh, instead of a, a deadline, if I may suggest, perhaps a timeline of events would be even better, and we can see when you're going to go to A, B, and C. The only thing that I want a very brief answer on is that you, we are already filing the data on students, period. And so the only thing we're doing now is adding the cost 
to bring on the IEP information and so forth, which come to about 800,000. If you already have the device and the storage and the personnel set up, then you already have those students' record. So you put a component in there. That's all you're doing because this is not just the, a, a system for the IEP. It's a system for everything that they have done. So I don't understand why it's so hard to just, uh, why it's costing so much. And I think that that's a pretty quick answer, sure. but I just don't know it. I think part of the um, thing that maybe we're misconnecting on here is when we store student data, it's paper, very small files. Audio files can get larger. Paper. Yeah, when we when we scan in a student's it's address images change, of the paper. It's images, images. of paper. Got it's very it. small, and audio files can be larger. You talk an hour file, two hour files, depending on a meeting. So it's the size of the files. No, that I missed that. I thought it was digital. That's a different thing. We, we got to get out the old age and bring it up. Okay, thank you. I would encourage board members if um, if you have further questions or want the work group to work on some of the things we'll work on uh, talking about uh, timelines of um, should the board approve a policy should legislation change what does training look like what would we need in terms of uh, beginning to scale up the the capacity um, other examples from other school districts in Missouri particularly because I want to see what we're doing in Missouri um, and I will reach out to the Tuscaloosa Sioux and I know that there are examples uh, uh, from uh, earlier in the year that, that the board has received from other school districts so we'll, we'll try to mine that as well. I think it would be beneficial for the work group to continue working. Um, looking at the security, asking our technology services team to continue to uh, get better um, examples about whether or not a cloud storage third party our current system, what those costs are, uh, risks and benefits. Um, I think, um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Uh, we talked about how do you handle transferring students, all of those kinds of things. I'm going to ask Elise to send the welcome letter to the board and their report again, just so you can see how we do uh, provide menu of options in that, in that sense. Um, and I think that's it. I, I, I'll look at, I think we've menu answered why. What's, I'm sorry? Menu oh, of accommodations. I, yeah, I wrote uh, menu of options. Um, so uh, accommodation options. The only thing I would ask for in the timeline is after listening to our discussion today and really wanting to get down in there on a lot of our questions, maybe just making sure that that process continues beyond and the board has another opportunity before the work group feels like they've completed their work sure, sure. for our another engagement work group here? again. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All righty. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much for, thank you. for thank all you. your work. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it very much.